Okay, well, today I'm working on 115, so yeah, yesterday I reached 114, and uh, something I learned was from that experience was that, well, you need to, you know, really feel your limits, like I've previously thought, but for a week or so I, I focused back on practicing the single elements and uh, really know was really careful about the technique and so on and I, I'm sure it did a lot of good but it also may get a bit stuck so take a look at this coming along great that might all already have been a completion but let's not call it just yet it has been just one hour so ah, take a look at this So let's do that. Academy of Sciences in Vatican City. These Pleiadians, however, cautioned that the creatures I have met in the California desert were not to be trusted. One year later, in February of 1955, President Eisenhower had yet another meeting with extraterrestrials. Researcher Art Campbell reveals that a second contact occurred at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. This time, following prearranged instructions, Ike's plane, Air Force One, a Columbine Three, landed at the base runway and taxied to a deserted stretch of tarmac, where it was approached by three hovering saucers. One landed, and the president alone was seen leaving Air Force One and entering the saucer. Forty-five minutes later, Ike reappeared unharmed, but exactly what transpired in this meeting is unknown. Okay, uh, let's go for 120 again.
which, surprise, surprise, feels slow after 120, which goes on to prove how everything is subjective. Or, let's say, uh, you know, relational to other things. Yet, had I prepared for some dire consequence, popular entertainment personality Arthur Godfrey was allegedly on board the Columbine 3 during this contact, and it was known that Godfrey and famed newscaster Edward R. Murrow both worked with National Civil Defense preparing pre-recorded messages in case of nuclear attack. Perhaps Ike was anticipating some alien reprisal, as it was becoming obvious that his treaty with the creatures from Reticulum was falling. According to Colonel Philip Corso, United States Army retiree and former advisor to the National Security Council during Eisenhower's administration. These creatures weren't benevolent alien beings who had come to enlighten human beings. They were genetically altered human automatons, cloned biological entities actually who were harvesting biological specimens on Earth for their own experimentation. As long as we were incapable of defending ourselves, we had to allow them to intrude as they wished. We had negotiated a kind of surrender with them as long as we couldn't fight them. By 1955, Eisenhower realized the treaty was a deception. Mutilated animals as well as humans were found across the United States. It was feared that lists of human abductees were incomplete and not all abductees were being returned. Obviously, public disclosure was an untenable option, likely precipitating a national panic and economic collapse. One fifty. In turn, disclosure to Congress was impossible as well. 
thus monies for the enormously expensive alien-related defense projects had to come from concealed sources. Considering this impasse, MJ-12, in concert with the CIA, devised a black ops, illegal drug pipeline into America via offshore Texas oil rigs provided by Zapata Oil Corporation's Chief Executive Officer George Herbert Walker Bush. This covert project was so successful, it spurred Bush's rise up the ranks of the CIA. Much to Eisenhower's regret, one I think. <coughs> Thank you. 